chapter 28, 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. And as we're flipping there, um, we're fixing to read kind of the last words of Jesus, and we're going to dive into them. Uh, but at this point, we've just gotten the news of the resurrection. We know what happened. Uh, both Marys ended up going to the tomb. We know what happened with the disciples. Um, we know that Jesus wasn't there. We know about the report of the guards, what they told the guards. Um, and now we're here uh, when Jesus is addressing all of these people. And this is basically kind of like his last words to everybody. And it's the Great Commission. And we've all heard that word, the Great Commission. Um, so let me paint an illustration bef- uh, for you before we dive in and read scripture. Um, but you've probably heard this in a couple different ways about how when you have something and someone else doesn't, and it's life-changing and you should share it with them. Um, that's kind of where we're going with all this tonight. Um, but I thought of this little thing the, the other day, and I, I guarantee everybody else has too, so it's not special. But imagine you're in the desert. Uh, you're completely drained of energy. You haven't had any water in I don't know how long, uh, you are like going to die. There's, you've got nothing, there's not a cactus in sight, there's not water in sight, like you are going to die because you are that dehydrated. There's no hope, like you've lost that hope. There's nothing left. And all of a sudden, boom, like there's a pond, right? There's, there's a little lake. You're probably going to go run and jump in that pond and you're going to drink all that water and man, it's going to be like the time of your life, right? And your hope uh, is going to be renewed. You're going to be rejuvenated. You're no longer suffering from what you used to be suffering from. And so there you go on your way, and your life has been changed, right? You have this water. It's, it changed your life completely. You're able to go on. And I don't know, maybe a mile down the road, the desert road, uh, you come across this other person, and man, they're just like you were. They are. They're parched, they're dehydrated. They've got almost nothing left in the tank. They've lost that hope. You've got a choice. Hey man, look, it's back here. There's, there's a lake back here. Like, it's, it's right over here. Let's go. Or we just pass right on by them knowing we have what can save their life. We have exactly what they need. And so tonight we're going to dive in to the Great Commission and, and knowing what God has laid out before us, what Jesus explained here, what he commanded us to do, commissioned us to do. And a lot of times we, if you're a Christian, if you are saved, if your life has been changed by Christ, a lot of times we've got that remedy, right? You, you, you've, you've always heard the, uh, the thing, if you've got the cure to cancer and you don't share it, you know, it's like you're crazy. Well, if you've got the cure to sin and we don't share it, are we crazy? Or are we too selfish? And that's what we've got to dive into tonight. We've got to open up and and just listen to what God has to say to us. So Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Uh, These kids, uh, they know the Great Commission like the back of their hand. Uh, Like if a kid were to, it's not even possible for a kid to come out of Children's Church and not know the Great Commission. Like it's not even, it's not even in the question, is it? Like they have to know it, okay? Um, So the Great Commission, let's go ahead and read it. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. They get on to me all the time because I learned it in King James Version when I was little. So I say low and into the end of all that. And so they're like, that's not how you say it, Chase. I'm like, okay, uh, so I had, to, I had to relearn the ESV version. Um, but there we see the Great Commission. We see what Jesus has just said. Um, let me ask this, and this is not a quiz, and you're not going to get graded, but does anybody know what our church's mission statement is? A church producing disciples to the nation. Close, we're, we're close. Justin, stand up or something, yeah. Uh, it's, it's on his shirt. Um, <laughs> they're both wearing it. Okay, well, y'all, y'all are the, I need y'all to stand up here the whole service. Um, now, one church producing disciples to reach the lost. We put an emphasis on one church because uh, youth ministry is not separate from 
the old timers. Uh, youth ministry is not separate from the middle agers. Youth ministry is not separate from anything, nor is what um, any of the older group, what we do in here, separate from anything else. We want it to be one church. There's reasons for that. That's scriptural. That, that's why we say one church, because we are doing this together. We are producing disciples. We're producing disciples not only, um, well, yeah, we're producing disciples, hopefully, that they go out and produce more disciples. So as a disciple, uh, it's kind of twofold. You are being discipled, and you are discipling. And that's hopefully what we are trying to accomplish through what we do. And then to reach the lost. That's ultimately, that's the main goal, right? Once you're saved, you've got, you've got two things in mind, to grow and to share. That's, that's what you've got. And so when we look at our mission statement, that is not just, it wasn't just came up, you know, out of a hat. And we said, you know, that's going to be our mission statement. That was purposefully put in for a reason to glorify God, and that is going to be our mission and our purpose. And so at any point in time, whether it doesn't matter if we're in a D group, I just got out of a D group, doesn't matter if we're in Sunday school, it doesn't matter what we're doing, if we're even just hanging out uh, at, uh, at El Capoco, because that's the only thing we can eat on Sundays, um, <laughs> and that's where we're hanging out that night, we need to embody this mission statement. Embody this mission statement uh, in, your, in your families embodied in your personal life. That, this is what we have to understand and have to do. But uh, yeah, one church producing disciples to reach the lost. So why is it important for us to have a mission statement? I like feedback, helps me out. Why do we have a mission statement? Why can't we just like say, hey, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Why did we make an effort to say this is our church's mission statement? To put it on the back of a t-shirt, to put it on Facebook, to put it wherever it is. Why do we have a mission statement? Too easy to get off track. Too easy to get off track? Okay, why else? Everybody has the same goal. Same goal? We're like-minded? Okay, we have a mission statement for a reason. And hopefully, as people become members, as people have been members, as people embody the mission statement here at Sutton, we are able to glorify God. We are able to spread the gospel. That is ultimately what we've got to do. And so I've got three points tonight. Uh, I don't have my watch on, uh, so I keep looking. I've looked at it like 25 times today, and uh, it's just not there. So I'll try to keep my phone and not, not go over time. But um, I've got three points today, and it's going to play into um, the Great Commission. It's going to play into how we are carrying out the Great Commission. But my first point or question is, has Jesus changed you? Has he changed you? Because number one, if he hasn't, I promise you he can, and you need to come talk to Brother Kevin or myself or anybody, our deacons, anybody else. Because he can change you, I promise. He can take the lowest of the low. I mean, I mean we, we look at guys like David, like Saul, who later was Paul, if he, he can change those guys, he did change those guys, he can change you, I promise you he can. Okay, David did all these horrible things and was a man after God's own heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. So if you have been changed by Jesus, if you are saved, and truly saved, biblically, we talked about this in our D groups, if you are truly biblically, you biblically responded to the gospel, if that's the case, then therefore you are a new creation. Nothing should be the same in your life, except, well, nothing should be the same in your life. Your appearance possibly changed as well. So behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. This is kind of like the crossroads earlier I mentioned with the water and telling the man, if we have an encounter with Jesus, there's only two options. We either accept him and fully embody who he is, or we reject him. There's no, hey, I'll come to that later, none of that. You're either accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. So if Jesus has changed us, there should be visible evidence in your life that the old has passed away. We talk to these students all the time, and I ask them, if I were to take you and 10 of your peers, 
And say we just had the technology to get in your brain and put everything up that you do. How much different would your life look than theirs? And they're like, you know, I guess they're trying to imagine actually doing that. They're like, can you do that? No, you can't. Um, how much different would your life truly look if we just laid everything out on the table from that of someone who's not saved? Last time I preached, we talked about uh, distinguishing between the holy and the common. So is your life holy? Do you try to live a holy life? Or has Jesus actually changed you? And if he has, please understand when I say this, that your life should be different. Every aspect of your life should be vastly different than what it was before. And people should be able to see that. They should definitely be able to see that. Number two, next question is, um, if Jesus has changed you, and we've established that, is are you growing? These are very small points that you could teach to a, I don't know, a two-year-old, but sometimes I feel like we need to hash them over again. We need to make sure we have these nailed down. Are you growing? If Jesus has changed us, then we should be diving into Scripture. We should be deep in prayer. We should be wanting to be as close to Jesus as we possibly can. Colossians 1.10 says, So as to walk in a manner worth of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So therefore, if Jesus has changed us, then we should be growing. Every day we should be growing. I'll uh, use an Alabama reference just because we're all tied. Um, <clears throat> Will Anderson, who's arguably probably, there's lots of others, but he's probably one of the best uh, bookends or a defensive end in college football. Um, they asked him, like, you know, what, what do you do to try to get better? He said, get 1% better every day. Um, that needs to be our mindset. I mean, 100% probably, but... Uh, we need to get better every single day, grow closer every single day. To never be content, we actually talked about being content with what we have in Jesus today in Sunday school, but to never be content with where we are in our relationship with Jesus. Once we get content, that's the devil letting you know things aren't okay because you feel like you're doing good. So are you growing in Jesus? There should be evidence in your life of you growing in Jesus Christ. And then number three, uh, you know, has Jesus changed you? Are you truly growing? And number three is, are you telling? The title of today's sermon um, was, What You Saying About It? And I, I, I just, I'm not very good with titles. Kevin's really good with them. I'm not. Um, so what you saying about it? What are you, what are you saying? Who are you telling? Who are you letting know? Psalm 96.3 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. In Acts 4.12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name among heaven or under heaven among men by which we must be saved. When's the last time, you know, this is rhetorical, the last time that you told someone about Jesus, the last time that you made it an effort that day, you woke up and said, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. Maybe the last time that, that, that Jesus was tugging at your heart a little bit, and maybe you didn't do it. Um, our previous pastor, Jason Bell, in Tennessee, uh, there was this lady who had been coming to church, and uh, we knew she wasn't saved, and then she just stopped coming altogether. And she, she got mad about something, um, and it was kind of a big stink up and all that. And Jason saw her in the supermarket the next day, uh, it was a food line or something. Jason saw her, and they were actually going, like, their carts were going to pass each other, and he was like, and God was telling him, you better do it. You know better. Like, you better do it. And he passed her up. The next aisle, they passed again. It was like, oh, you know when you pass somebody in the, in the, in the, in the grocery store? Three aisles later, they pass again. This is like 10 or 15 minutes has gone on now. And he does it. He said, God, I get it. I understand. I know, okay, I, I get it. And I'm sorry I didn't do it before. You see, when God calls, when he beckons, we need 
to answer. We need to carry out what he is trying to get us to understand. I uh, talk to these kids all the time, and I'm not saying that, you know, any of us have it perfect, but uh, there are some hurting people in this world. There are kids that have to worry about where that meal's coming from. They have to worry about if mom and dad will play with them, worry about if mom and dad will even, even be uh, lucid, I guess, is the, or in the right state of mind. I tell them there's hurting kids all around them, and they need to be that light, the shining light that I know they can be, that I know that Jesus Christ is to these people. But I'm going to say the same thing to you. There are people in your jobs, people that you come in contact with every single day that are hurting. They are like that man in the desert with no hope. Absolutely none. Have, has any of y'all ever had no hope in a situation before? You maybe felt like it. You maybe felt like there, there's, there's nothing that can end this misery or this sorrow. Miss Jennifer, what was that name of that song that we just sang? From Children's Church. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. He, can. he will, he does, and he is. My question to you is, is where is that love that we're supposed to have for other people? Where is that love? You see, we are supposed to be burdened for these people in our community, for lost family members, for anyone who's lost. We are to have a burden. It is supposed to weigh you down. All the hopelessness and the sin and everything else that goes on in our world. with how much sin and filthiness that goes on in our world, it should weigh you down. But we go through our life like it doesn't bother us. Maybe because it's not, we don't live in a big city, it's not as prevalent. But I'm going to tell you, if we look just even a little bit, it is prevalent. My challenge to you is to if you don't have it already, to get that burden back. You should, it should really bother you. It should really cut you deep that there are that many hurting people all around you and you've done little to nothing about it. I'm not saying y'all haven't done little to nothing, but you get what I'm saying. On a grand scheme of things, how much more could we do than we actually do? We do very little, very little in the eyes of God. Please plead with yourself. The Holy Spirit, I, I ask that guys we would get that burden back. That we would truly be able to see the hurt in these kids, in our own families, in the people around us. Because if we don't, we're going to keep bebopping through life, thinking everything's fine and dandy. When truth is, we've got the water. We could lead them to it. We can't make them drink, but we can get them there. I hope that we can get that back as individuals, as a youth group, as a church, one church. If we can truly get back to where we have a burden for hurting people in this world, for the lost people, for the hopeless, we get back to that, hopefully, our love for God's people grows. We start sharing the gospel like we never have before. I pray that we're able to do that here at Sutton. Two, two last things and I'll, I'll leave you. Oftentimes we, we may think that this is a suggestion or this is just God saying, hey, if you want to do this. 
But I'm here to tell you, if you'll read into it, uh, the authority of heaven and earth. I'll say it again. The authority of heaven and earth gave you a command. It is not optional to evangelize the nations. You have no choice in this matter. He has called you to do it, and you are to do it in whatever capacity you can. Warren Wiersbe put it like this, Since Jesus Christ today, yesterday, and tomorrow has all authority, we may obey him without fear. No matter where he leads us, no matter what circumstances we face, he is in control. By his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated all enemies and won for himself all authority. Christianity is a missionary faith. The very nature of God demands this. In 2 Peter, we see that God is not willing that any should perish. If we are the children of God and share his nature, then we will want to tell the good news to the lost world. I'm going to read the Great Commission again, and then we'll end in prayer. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we come to you now. God, I ask that uh, your words would continue to speak to us, God, that we wouldn't just walk out these doors and forget what your word says. Lord, I ask that you would grow that burden inside of us. Hopefully, Lord, that we are able to block out all of our selfishness and truly see that there are hurting people all around us, God. They need you. They need your love. They need salvation. So God, I ask that you give us the courage. You help us to go along with this. Lord, help us not to stray from it. I ask that, Lord, you would keep us accountable. God, thank you again for all that you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Brother Kevin.